Hello and welcome to the Attorney Post, where we give you the inside scoop with top attorneys in their field. And now here's our host, Justin West. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Attorney Post, where we figure out what's going on in various facets of the law with lawyers at the top of their game to help you navigate the various ins and outs of uh, legal fields and jurisdictions. Because as I always say, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. Today, I'm joined by uh, Jonathan Leveritz, uh, who runs uh, Leveritz Law Firm out there in New York City. Jonathan, how are you doing today? Doing well, Justin. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so you guys may catch a little bit of a weird interaction between me and uh, Jonathan or, or Yoni, uh, as he goes by short. We actually recorded this video beforehand, uh, but we had a couple of issues in the process. Uh, so we're having to reshoot the video again. Um, so if, the, if it feels a little a little off the, on the rails, that's why. Uh, but in general, she'll be totally fine. And I'm really excited because I know that he has just a wealth of knowledge behind him. And uh, I'm really excited to get to dig into those, uh, dig into his questions, and even give him a chance to answer bigger and better than before, which is great. So uh, you know what? At the end of the day, we we like to, when life gives you lemons, as they say, you make you make del, you make lemonade. When life gives you dilemmas, you make lemonade, as they say. Um, this is his website, the Leverett Law Firm. It's leverettslaw.com. Uh, we will have a link, as always, in the show notes down below. Uh, that is simply his last name, leverettslaw.com. L-e-v-o-r-i-t-z, leverettslaw.com. You can also call him at 718-942-4004. 718-942-4004. He is a family law attorney working in New York City. Uh, he works in a number of the boroughs in and around New York City. If you know the iconic city that never sleeps, then you know New York City. Uh, and he is your guy. So we're going to dig into what he does here in a few minutes. As always, we are going to jump over and read from our sponsors first. Our first sponsor today is nationalerc.org. You may have noticed that the world went through a pandemic and many businesses were forced to shut down and had reduced hours and supply chain issues and interruptions and ultimately suffered from reduced revenue in 2020 and 2021. What you may not know is that the Congress recently passed the CARES Act, which allocated over $400 billion in stimulus funds for small businesses that never needs to be paid back. This is not a loan like the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. It is essentially free money for your business or firm that can be spent in whatever way you think makes the most sense. Right now, NationalERC.org is helping small businesses get the maximum amount of money that they can and you can calculate and see how much you can get back by visiting nationalerc.org. The average small business they work with gets back over $200,000 to invest in their business. They've helped uh, over $1.3 billion in funds get back to uh, businesses out there. And uh, as always, the calculator is free and there's never any fee unless they secure funding for you. That is nationalerc.org. Our second sponsor, at the top of the show is Groove Funnels. If you love spending five to ten thousand dollars to build a brand new website, and you love paying monthly hosting fees of three or four hundred dollars for that platform that allows you to, you know, sell your products and services to your clients or customers, whatever it happens to be, that by all means keep doing whatever it is that you're doing. But if you're like me, I hate that stuff, and that's why I personally recommend Groove Pages, the all-new, all-in-one funnel website sales platform for internet marketing legend Mike Phil Same. Visit theturningpost.com/groove to sign up for free and build a complete site at no cost. There's literally no cost, no credit card required. Uh, and I believe you can actually build up to three fully functioning web platforms. It's a Swiss Army knife of a platform. It can let you build pages and funnels, uh, sell your things. It has web mail hosting. It's got affiliate programs. It's got video. It's got webinars. It's got a membership platform. It's basically a Swiss Army knife that can build anything you can think of. They can build it. Uh, and I believe it's completely free to get started. And I think they even have like some lifetime plans. So you can get in there one time, uh, pay one time and uh, have a lifetime account with them. So I've actually used them for over a year and a half. I like them a lot. So I personally recommend uh, just visit the attorneypost.com slash groove. That is the attorneypost.com slash groove. All right. Uh, well, uh, Yanni, thanks again for uh, taking the time to meet with me. Sorry for the uh, hiccup in our uh, ability to get things published. But you know what? Life moves on and uh, I'll take full responsibility for that. So no big worries there. Uh, I'm talking with Jonathan Leveritz. Uh, he is a prominent figure in the legal community, particularly distinguished in the fields of matrimonial and family law. Since his admission to the New York Bar in 2005, Attorney Leveritz has made a significant impact in the uh, or with the establishment of the law office of his, that bears his name, Jonathan S. Leveritz. Uh, his approach is notably holistic, uh, addressing a wide spectrum of legal issues, and he has a team of diverse legal experts ensuring uh, comprehensive solutions for his clients. Attorney Leveritz has earned top ratings from Martindale Hubble and has been consistently recognized 
recognized as a super lawyer, underscoring his expertise and success in his field. He is his practice primarily is focused in New York County and the surrounding areas, and he's renowned for his representing of various network high network uh, individuals, celebrities, um, as well as particularly advocating for fathers' rights uh, in family law. Uh, his commitment extends beyond his legal practice. He has contributed to very legal legal various legal publications. It's the end of the day. I've been talking too much today. I think when we did our first conversation, it was the beginning of the day, and I couldn't talk because I hadn't had my full cup of coffee yet. That's just life, right? His unique combination of experience in business and civil law and security trading provides him with valuable insights, uh, further enhancing his ability to achieve successful outcomes for his clients. Uh, when we talked before, we talked about a forensic uh, look at uh, divorce. So I'm actually really kind of intrigued to even dive deeper into that topic, but I'm sure I missed a lot as I always do because an intro is just an intro and it's just a couple of sentences to summarize who you are. I'm sure I left out a lot. So uh, Yoni, my, my very first question to you is, what did I miss? Well, I, I think you actually caught on to everything, but uh, some of the points that I'd like to highlight are the fact that we are a holistic firm. We do have a forensic accountant that we work with. We do have a forensic doctor that we work with. We don't send our clients into forensic evaluations, you know, completely blind. We we do our research. We stay on top of things. And most of all, we're on top of the law and the facts of each individual person's case. We don't go ahead and job these things out. Everything is done custom made, like going to a bakery and having a cake made. We do it from scratch and we build it from the ground up. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So if I didn't know anything about you, and uh, I mean, obviously, I understand that you uh, you run a law firm, you're in New York City, you do family law. So I, I already have a, a gist of what you do. But if I didn't know who you were, uh, and we had 30 seconds or a minute in an elevator, and uh, you can give me your pitch. Tell me, Yoni, who who do you help? Who is your primary customer, your primary client? Um, where are they located? How do they find you? Give me give me give me your, your elevator pitch. Well, typically, clients find me in uh... Uh, by word of mouth or other attorneys. So we are uh, the largest part of our practice is built by attorney referrals. So we get a lot of referrals from attorneys. We get a lot of referrals by word of mouth. And those are our two primary sources of business. If I was going to sum this up in an elevator pitch, I would basically say that by coming to us, you're getting a group of people who care about the ultimate result and care about trying to make the client as happy as possible given their circumstances. Of course, not everybody is happy. Of course, we have some people who are unhappy because you can't make all people happy all the time. Okay, but we do try and we do our best to make sure that we negotiate as hard as possible and we fight as hard as possible in court to try and obtain the ultimate outcome that the client is seeking. I mean, that's a great way to sum it up. And uh, I think it gives a, a pretty good explanation of what you do. So you guys work on all aspects of family law. Um, is that right? You do everything from from prenuptials to you know custody and, and, and child support and all of that stuff and, and all stops in between. Is that right? All stops in between. In fact, we do a lot of third party litigation when it comes to what's called the constructive trust. We do what's called uh, uh, partition actions. We do basically everything that you need in terms of dealing with your divorce action. Therefore, if your mother-in-law is on the deed or your father-in-law is on the deed and the matrimonial court doesn't want to deal with it, we can handle that for you. Someone gives away the marital residence just before the divorce, we can deal with that for you. And we deal with those things on a pretty regular basis because unfortunately, people always have some sort of game that they want to play, either with regard to their income or with regard to uh, how they're setting themselves up for the divorce as part of pre-divorce planning. Sure. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I was just now noticing, I think when we talked before, uh, you were angled differently. You have, you have quite the view there in your office. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm appreciating you uh, some of the New York skyline behind you there. <laughs> yeah. We've got a beautiful view. If, you, if I was in Tiffany's office, my main paralegal, she actually can see the Statue of Liberty from her office uh, window. Wow. Um, so, do, do, yes, do you draw we, the short straw and you got the good office? Is that what worked there? Or? Nah, it just worked out this way that I got the uh, smaller office and she got the larger office with staff and printers and copiers and everything else. 
Gotcha. Well, you know, that's nice because you get a much more private space, I guess. So that's good. So what got you yes. into law? Did were you were you the type of person, Yoni, that that when you grew up, you just knew you wanted to be an attorney? You know, other kids are playing GI Joe or or whatever, and and you're you're watching Perry Mason. Or did you kind of stumble into law? Like how how did you get into law? And then what got you into family law in particular? Well, watching Perry Mason and Law and Order are given. Okay, L.A. Law too. I mean, you, you can never miss an episode, regardless of what field you were going into. Uh, they were they were classics and they were wonderful shows. But putting that aside, what got me into the law was the fact that uh, I was getting divorced. And as part of my divorce, I was realizing what lawyers were doing and how they were doing it and the thought process behind it. And I thought that I could do things just a little bit better by offering more handholding and more compassion and trying to help people understand the pros and cons of the decisions that they were about to make in their lives. So you just kind of threw yourself into into law at that point. What what were you doing? Uh, if I can ask that before your your divorce was that you you ran a business and then you saw how it all kind of fell apart or what was what was the what was the what was the pain? <laughs> Uh, well, the pain was my divorce. Okay, that's um, right. that, that 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 was my 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 main pain. But what threw me into it was the fact that uh, I was going into business, and I was I had actually several retail stores at one point in time. So I have business background as well as you know my degree and things of that sort. But and, and of course you know my securities registrations, which have now lapsed, but I did have them at one point in time including the investment advisory capacity. But uh, the moment that changed my life was when I realized that sometimes the way you present things to a judge can make the difference between a yes or a no. And when I realized that sometimes lawyers hesitate to write motions, and we are very big on motion practice in terms of trying to help people get their story out before the court and get them the relief that they need, as opposed to trying to cut corners, which I found most of my divorce lawyers, not my last one, but my prior divorce lawyers were trying to cut corners. Gotcha. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by motion practice? For the average person, that probably sounds like Greek to them, and they don't really know what you're saying. What 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 is that? Why is it important? And, and how do you emphasize that and what you guys do? Well, basically, many lawyers are afraid of writing, okay? And a motion is a written application or a written document that goes before the court to ask for certain relief. Most judges hold that without a motion, you can't get that relief. But most lawyers, not most lawyers, but a bunch of lawyers or a group of lawyers try and do everything by just asking for it. And they go without the motion. And therefore, you have a lack of due process. So what you have to do is, in many occasions, is set forth the story before the court. You have to attach proof, which are called exhibits. You have to attach your evidence. You have to go ahead and explain thoroughly why your position is superior to that of the other party. Because when you get in there for oral argument, Maybe you have 30 minutes or 45 minutes between both attorneys to explain your positions. But if you have a motion, the court has to rule on it ultimately. And the court basically has to take a look at the facts and take a look at the evidence and say, hey, this meets the legal requirements. Maybe we should give this guy or gal the relief that they're seeking. Makes a lot of sense, I, you know. Again, for the average person, especially if they're considering, you know, what their rights are, if they're looking at possibly facing a divorce, I'm sure they've got questions. And that actually is probably something that maybe they wouldn't even think to ask about. In fact, here's free advice. Put a put a whole page on your blog about, you know, what is a motion advocacy in a sense or something along those lines and, and, and pre-answer those questions. Because that's kind of a fascinating topic that I've never really delved into before or thought about in, in that way. So that's really cool. Um, but let me ask you this. So um, now – You've been practicing almost 20 years. Uh, 2005 is why it says when you pass the bar. Is that right? So you're going Correct. on 19, so, 20 years? 19 years in May. 19 years in, in May. Actually, no, October. In October. Well, no. I am. Congratulations. I'm sorry, March. <laughs> 19 you're years less, in March. Sorry. Less, you know, all these years, they away. kind of blend together. <laughs> that is okay. You know, I started, I incorporated my business 
14, 15 years ago. It was also at the, end, the very end of March, like March 31st, the very last of the month. So that's kind of my anniversary month too. So there you go. Um, I'm sure in your experience, um, you know what I'm saying? You've, you've probably had a lot of ups and downs. You've had some amazing wins and successes for your clients. You've probably also had some, some failures. In fact, you kind of alluded to a couple there a little bit ago, or these things that you've learned along the way um, when you mentioned, you know, learning about, you know, motion law and, and what you actually personally experienced. Um, I've always found one of the best educators in life is, of course, failure. As long as you learn from it, it's really a slow burn win at the end of the day. Um, can you let my listeners know about one time in your practice of law when you experienced a setback or or something you would consider to be a failure, but what did you learn from it? How do you carry that forward to make sure you're always giving that best care uh, to your clients? Well, I, I would say when I first started off, my emotions were not as thorough in terms of law. And I was able over the years to expand the law that I put into the motions. Therefore, my emotions became much stronger. In fact, many attorneys call me or email me and ask me for samples of my motions because um, I wasn't strong enough on the law. And I found that by taking more CLE courses, continuing legal education courses, and by studying the law on a regular basis and reading the updates and studying what was going on and looking for different ways to um, skin the proverbial cat, you know, to, to figure out ways of helping my clients, I was able to uh, do better for them. And that's what I've learned over the course of the years. I, I've learned what motions will fly, what motions won't fly, how to try and make them better, how to try and preserve things and 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 try and uh, make the client situation better. And it doesn't always work. Um, you know, nothing always works. But, uh, you know, in, in this situation where you have the ability to not be afraid of putting pen to paper, um, you know, the, the, the pen being mightier than the sword, Okay, you have the ability to go ahead and help clients more. That makes a lot of sense. Um, well, I know you've had some big wins as well. I know you have things that you're very, very proud of. And you know, sometimes when we're falling asleep at night, sometimes we think about the we think about the failures. Um, but sometimes we think about the wins. What's one of those things that you just think about and it fills you with pride that you're just so pleased with how it turned out? Maybe maybe it was going before an attorney or going before a judge and thinking that you guys had the losing side and and the judge is just like, "No, you know what? You've totally swayed me." Or maybe, you know, you you helped a you helped a, a client get reconciled with with their uh their spouse or whatever it happens to be. What's one or two of the feathers in your cap of your law practice, Yoni? Well, uh, a feather or two. I mean, we have situations where we've tried post-nuptial cases and uh, we've ended up with damages of a dollar, okay, which uh, was a tremendous victory. Uh, when the person was seeking millions and millions of dollars in damages, we've had custody victories. Uh, we had a victory just the other day, which was, uh, you know, something to write home about. We had a criminal case where the person was accused of violating an order of protection. And uh, we've got an incredible deal for him in criminal court as a result of the way we litigated it and dealt with the prosecutor and put them in a position where they were able to um, basically walk away from the case without too much of a problem and not have it impact their custody case, which was the most important aspect for this particular client. Um, very cool. This is a weird question, um, but it's one I started asking about uh, six months ago. It's always fine. It's just kind of, I get funny answers and uh, sometimes it's some of the best stuff. You've probably dealt with absurdity. Um, and sometimes absurdity just makes you shake your head and go, what's wrong with this world? <laughs> but sometimes uh, absurdity, you know, it can be humorous as well. What's one of the most absurd things that you've encountered in your practice of law? It could be, you know, again, the way a case went out, the way a judge reacted, the way a client reacted, the way a, a witness or the other side, co-counsel, you know, what's one of the most absurd things you've encountered in your practice of law? I encounter absurd things all the time. My, my, my favorites are when people get the law wrong and I have the ability to correct them. And I have the ability to do so because I'm, I'm a reader. And I'm a writer. Um, you know, we get papers out. We, 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 we go through things. And we see this on a regular basis. Uh, 
We saw this the other day in a family in, in a Supreme Court case, which has what's called concurrent jurisdiction, meaning equal jurisdiction to family court. And they have just recently obtained an order in family court just two weeks beforehand. And I explained to the judge, there's no case because the case was over, you know, in family court. And it was just an absurd gesture to say that, listen, we have to relitigate everything as a result of the fact they weren't happy with what they got in family court. And the court thankfully agreed with me. But the bottom line is it was an absurd gesture. And it's one of the biggest problems that, that I see with regard to people not looking at the law or looking at the facts of their case before making moves. Okay. Interesting. Um, I had another question as a follow-up on that. And sometimes sometimes the dog just goes off without uh, <laughs> without being hitched up to the cart. We'll come back to that if I think about it. Um, so 20 years it's it's the turn of the century 19 years um the, the the turn of the millennia and obviously i think everyone has experienced that just life has changed so much we we are in a much more digital world than we were you know uh, 19 years ago um and i'm sure that that has brought about a host of changes both the digital aspects in general and just you know legal changes law changes in general um that have have changed and 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 shaped the way new york city uh or new york state um practices uh Family law. What are some of the biggest tra- changes that have evolved uh, and come about during your your tenure as a as a family law attorney? I would say that a lot of things have gone digital. We now have virtual court appearances. Ten years ago, that was unheard of. Pre COVID, that was unheard of. But now we actually have the ability to log on from our offices for some co- judges, some conferences, not everything. There's still a lot of things that are in person. But we have a lot of things that uh, we can do digitally. I appeared in court today via uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams, and it was a phenomenal experience. I was able to save the client on commuting to court, commuting from court, waiting in court. Courts take you on time. Court appointments are, are actually made as opposed to just show up at 930 and wait your turn. Um so that's been a tremendous change. The other big change is the filing of papers. Pre-COVID, you basically had to walk your papers into a clerk and basically run them up and downstairs, depending upon which courthouse you were in, to actually get them filed. Now we have something called NICIF. I have no idea what it stands for, but it's called NICIF. Okay? And NICIF basically allows you to file papers electronically and serve them electronically. So you have the situation where uh, you're able to sit in your office and process documents and the need for people to run back and forth to court has basically diminished to zero. So those two changes alone have been absolutely fantastic. New York State Unified Court System. <laughs> yes. Uh, I can look or, it up. Or is it, yes, the Unified Court <laughs> System. I think that's what it was. Anyway, I'm just Googling it because, you know, I do that sometimes. Um, has uh, social media, I mean, obviously I, I work in a marketing space. Social media is a really big thing where I am and we use it a lot of times for our clients, but I, I imagine, I mean, when you got started, Facebook was barely a thing at all. I mean, it was 2003, 2004, 2005 is when it was still, you had to have like a, a .edu. At one point it was just at Harvard, right? And now, I mean, we've gone beyond MySpace, we've gone beyond Facebook and Twitter and, and Snapchat and Instagram and everything else. How often does social media play a role in the way that cases, divorces, et cetera, are, are litigated or settled? They play a role in terms of discovery. There are many things that you can learn, whether it be business deals, whether it be about relationships with uh, other partners or other parties, um, whether it be about uh, loans and other transactions between parties, uh, you know, people loaning money to each other. Um Uh, These things have changed the world completely. I mean, the idea of having access to uh, people's conversations and what people are doing, even in terms of custody cases, uh, you know, you have the ability to show that mom or dad or significant other is out partying when they have custody of the child. Um, You know, it it just changed the world tremendously. Uh, We use these uh, resources all the time. In fact, in some cases, um, we have built uh, 
the foundation for the case on social media. Uh, one particular real estate developer who used to brag about all of his sales and who claimed his business wasn't doing well, we just whipped out his Instagram account. And all of a sudden, the tune changed. No, I so, guess I've been yeah. successful. I don't know. Yeah, oh, going from uh, making nothing to, hey, I've just sold five you know million dollar apartments. Crazy. It's a funny world and you know social media is just so ubiquitous and it always kind of fascinates me. I'm I'm fairly fairly reserved by modern standards on social media. My wife is way more reserved than I am on social media. So hopefully it'll never be an issue in either of our lives. Um though I do occasionally get political, but that's you know in this modern era, doesn't everybody, right? Uh though I keep that totally separate from my business profile, obviously. Um, but it's kind of fascinating to see how that has just changed everything and just you know how it becomes a miscible piece of evidence and something you can change entire outcomes of cases on that's just fascinating um sure we use text messages all the time as evidence that's right that yeah no um shoot i almost remembered what i was gonna say <laughs> it's one of those days <laughs> listeners you know how i am that's just life you're used to it sorry uh Jonathan. <laughs> you're getting me at my okay. final right um so let me ask you this. I, I know you guys do a lot of different styles of cases. And I know one of the things you guys focus on, it's not your sole focus by any means, but you do a lot of um, high net worth divorce cases, people with businesses, people with lots of assets. How complex do those get? And what sort of specialties do you need to have in order to engage in something like that? They involve multiple experts, everything from accountants, forensic accountants, uh, because you actually need both in most of those cases. Um, you need people to track cash flow. You need people to track depreciation. You need people to track um, uh, everything in terms of uh, cost of goods sold to, uh, you know, what, what's going on with revenue and why there's been a revenue change or how there's been a revenue change. You need to know some, you need someone who knows about the industry, who knows about the business who can research the industry or research the business. These things are very complicated and you really need a team of people. And thankfully we have a, a team of people who can go ahead and look at these things and evaluate different options in terms of settlement, which is important and different options in terms of litigation. Sometimes litigation is not the best option. See that being the case. Um, I had asked you when we talked before, and I don't fully remember your answer, so I'll ask you again because I think it's a fun question. Um, have you ever been working on a um, – actually, I think I remember your answer, but you know what? It was a good answer, so I'll still ask you anyway. Um, have you ever been working on a case, uh, working on a, on, a, on a divorce, and you've done something or worked with them in such a way that it's actually helped them to resolve their issues and they decide to not get divorced? Does that, does that happen? Does it happen often? And if it happens, does it last? It doesn't happen often, and it, for the most part, it doesn't last. I would say in 19 years of practice, I've seen it last solidly one time. In general, I would tell you that people come and go, and the relationships come and go, and it's very difficult to repair a relationship from the point where you said, I'm getting divorced, or the mudslinging that exists during the course of a divorce. Therefore, it's a situation where um, you know, e even when we enter into postnuptial agreements as a result of the, of the divorce action, you, you, you have people that just simply resent what happened and people throw things in each other's faces. It's the natural part of relationships. Gotcha. So How do you... it doesn't really last most of the time. Well, there you go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't count on it. You know, may maybe you'll be two in a thousand, but you never know. Um, how do you deal with the stress that comes with the, the dissolution of families? And, and more importantly, how do you help your clients deal with that stress? Because I know when you're dealing with with even just, just a, a couple, you know, maybe some assets, that's probably sometimes contentious. But if you've got children, if you've got, you know, um, and someone to live with mom and someone to live with dad or whatnot, how do you deal with the emotional aspects of family law? And how do you help your clients process that and 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 get the best outcome well the best outcome is different from how i help them deal with it because the best outcome is really 
you know, what something is going to, what, what the ultimate uh, aspect is going to be that's going to satisfy the client, because the client is, of course, your main concern. But we work with therapists and we work with other people to help them through the process. And we do a lot of handholding. A lot of times clients panic and we need to go ahead and just talk them off the ledge. And by doing that, it relaxes them and they feel better about things because they know that someone is there for them. They know that someone is taking care of them and is on top of their matter. So communication is really at the essence of it. I think that's that's life in general, right? <laughs> being able to communicate, being able to communicate well. Uh, and of course, in the midst of a of an incredibly stressful event in life, what's the the scale? I don't remember the name of it, but the scale for like the painfulness of life events and the you know, death of a loved one, uh, birth of a child, and and divorce are like the big three, if I recall. Um, they are they are the big three. Divorce being worse than death. Uh, yeah, well, it's it's a kind of death, isn't it? And it's a death that upends the rest of your life in a lot of ways. Um, so absolutely, uh, sounds uh, something. I hope I never have to go through. <laughs> Just say, like, yes. I hope I never have to hire you. <laughs> I hope it never happens. I appreciate that. Um, well, speaking of which, what is your approach to things like um, like alternative dispute resolution, mediation, uh, stuff like that in family law cases? Does that work out? Is it effective? Is it more effective in certain times or places or locations even or situations uh, than it is in others? I have found that mediation in conjunction with litigation works relatively speaking well. It helps people come to terms, and then the lawyers can fine-tune those terms. Unfortunately, many mediators or psychologists or social workers or uh, lawyers who do not focus on litigation, and therefore they do not know the law. Some mediators know the law and are able to help people come to a resolution which is suitable to the law. But you still need an advocate to go ahead and put things together in a way that makes sense for the parties. Also, a lot of people have a tendency to say yes to things that they don't necessarily mean yes to because they didn't understand them. And the mediator is working with both parties. Therefore, you have to have a mediator who's willing to tell people the pros and cons of their decisions, which is really the job of the litigator. So you kind of need both. It doesn't work without it. Although the alternative dispute resolution process in arbitration, which does not apply to custody cases, but applies to monetary cases, okay, is extremely useful if you get a good mediator. You have to have someone who's good, who knows the laws, and you have to have lawyers who set the parameters for the arbitration in a way where you have the proper rights, the right to object to evidence the right to object to hearsay, the right to object to uh, certain documents coming into evidence. You have to have the ability to have them set a standard, and that standard has to be um, imposed properly. You can't just walk into an arbitrator and have them sit and decide, especially someone who's a member of the clergy or someone who's a member of uh, an organization, and assume that you're going to get the best result. Because you're not. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to get someone who's going to put together a decision, and that decision is very hard to overturn. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, I had a related question to that one, too. I, fi I find that aspect kind of fascinating. Uh, and I, I've talked to people that are, they used to be family law, and then they switched to only doing mediation. Like, this is all I do, and it's like the most meaningful part of my, my existence, which I find interesting. Um, and I guess, so do you, do you and your firm, do you work with specific mediators? Do people bring their own mediators? Do they need to hire a mediator? Do you have a bank of people you refer to? How does that process work out? Sometimes we refer to mediators, but it's better if the lawyer does not choose them because then it appears to the other side that there's a bias involved. And you don't want anyone going into a mediator that they're not going to listen to. So using a court-appointed mediator is one option. Using the mediation programs and the court pro process is another option. Using uh, mediators that people find, whether it be online or have referrals to, is another option. But most of the time, these agreements do not last either. 
you find people coming back on custody and visitation issues and you find people coming back on child support issues more frequently for mediation agreements than you do from agreements that were made between lawyers. Again, things, it's inside baseball talk, right? That's the stuff that I just wouldn't figure out. But I guess, I mean, it makes sense. And I guess it would make sense for people to be a little, I guess, cautious at the very least um, when you refer to them to a mediator and they don't have control or say or knowledge of who that person is or whatnot. I guess if you had like a a, 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 a joint group of people that both sides are like, yeah, no, we totally love all these people. Maybe that would work. I don't know. Um, I was noticing on your page, uh, you talk about uh, father's rights. Um, and I think that's an interesting area of the law because I feel like there was a time when the, the phrase father's rights just wasn't a thing, whether it's because people weren't aware of it being an issue uh, or it's become more of an issue over the years. But with your advocacy for things like father's rights, what do you think are what are some of the common misconceptions people encounter in, in family law when it comes to paternal roles, especially in, in New York City? Well, I, I think the common misperception is that males don't get custody. And that's simply not the case. Males get custody. Females get custody. Um, you know, mothers and fathers, both under the law, are looked at as equals. OK, there's no quote unquote presumption of someone being a better parent. So you have to prep the person to be a better parent. Now, on the flip side of that, when we do women's rights cases, we also have to prepare them to do, you know, certain things at certain times if their lives are not structured around children. But you find most women have their lives structured around children. They're structured around doctor's appointments, around uh, sports events. And, and you find most men were focused on their work or focused on supporting the family. So you have to find a way to bring them together, okay, and bring the process together to explain to them that this is a matter of priorities. And the priority has to be the children. So whether we represent the man or a woman or two women or any combination of people, we are doing it to help them bring about the best possible parenting skills available. And we coach them. And that's how those types of cases work. Is this even a question that makes sense to ask? Roughly what percentage does it, I mean, I'm sure it's just case by case, right? So maybe it doesn't even make sense to ask the question, but generally speaking, do courts still favor the mother when it comes to things like uh, like visitation and custody? Um, or is it really a lot more? Because I know at one point it was statistically, it was very much uh, fathers had way fewer rights and the presumption was always on the side of the mother. Has that shifted a lot in the last couple of decades? Tremendously. It has shifted way, way in favor of fathers having more rights. And uh, now women have to be more careful, which is why we, of course, even though it's not on the web page yet, we dedicate a lot of time to women's rights. OK, so we kind of balance things out. I represent an equal number of women and an equal number of men. I would say it all fluctuates depending upon caseload and time frame. But uh, we represent an equal number of uh, men and women. But it's a matter of how you focus in on the client and how you focus in on the needs. You know, many times people are very emotional when going through these circumstances. So you got to tell them, don't text the other party. Don't, don't harass them. Don't bother them. Focus in on the child. Focus in on the child's needs. Don't talk about yourself. Don't talk about anything but the child so you can focus in on the most important thing of all, which is the best interest of the child, which is the standard by which we all are governed, men and women. I think that's a good uh, criterion <laughs> by all means. <laughs> Make sure the kids are taken care of. I think that really is uh, absolutely the, the most important aspect there. And, uh, and don't sit and wallow. No pity parties. Don't, 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 don't sit and wallow and try and write text messages uh, about things that are not related to the children. Stick to the task at hand. That's fair. That's good advice. Um, here's a more playful question for you. Uh, I noticed, and you don't need to drop any names. I'm sure you probably can't. Um, but I noticed that you have worked with celebrities and high profile individuals, public figures in in New York. Are there any um, 
Are there are there any particular considerations that you have to take when it comes to handling a, a matrimonial case that involves a public figure or a celebrity, uh, whether it's in you know in New York or, or or whatnot, or are they all processed 100% the same? No, they're not processed the same at all. You have to look at the public uh, perception issues in terms of what's going on in that particular case. There are many times where, um, just by way of example, anonymous A or anonymous B, whatever you want to call them. Uh, is involved in an affair or is involved in another relationship or they have a child from another relationship. And that's going to cost them their uh, celebrity endorsements, let's say, just as a hypothetical. Okay. You want to make sure that you negotiate that divorce and you do not bring that divorce to court because you do not want to end up in a situation where your client ends up losing his, his or her endorsements. I guess that would affect both parties if the spouse is going to get a portion of that money. <laughs> it, it, it does, but sometimes spiked, you know, uh, you know, to cut off your nose to spite your face. Yeah, uh, you know, it's a phrase because it's a thing, and sometimes, sometimes people actually do that. I guess. Um, yes, they do. Well, Yoni, I appreciate you uh, having the time to reshoot this with me again. I am sorry for the hiccups that we had beforehand. I don't want to take up your whole afternoon. Um, so here in a minute, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you our, our our famous closing questions. Just to refresh you on those, the question number one will be, uh, you know, if you can go back in time and, and, and give young Jonathan some advice, and by extension, you know, somebody maybe green behind the gills, fresh out of law school today, what advice would you give and why? Other than the obvious, buy a lot of Bitcoin, hold till 60K, right? <laughs> And then question number two will be, if I gave you my magic pen, which you can see here, Zoom is blurring out a little bit. If I gave you a magic pen, and with this pen, you can strike a law from the books, you can add a law to the books that's not over there, or you can edit an existing law. And that can be a local law, it can be a statewide law, it can be a national law, it can have sweeping ramifications that affects everybody, or it can be that stupid little county rule that makes you fill out forms and triple get eight times a week. What law would you change and why? While you're percolating on that, we're going to jump over and take a look again at your website. Again, I am talking with uh, Yonatan Leverett, or Yoni of the Leverett's Law Firm. That is leverettslaw.com, L-E-V-O-R-I-T-Z Law, leverettslaw.com, 718-942-4004. If you are in the New York area and you have a family law issue, uh, I can say for sure, and you've heard me talk to him, um, he has a, a wealth of knowledge and will be a wonderful resource for you. As always, we will have links in the description down below. Uh, our final uh, sponsor for the day is Rank With News. And I don't actually have my uh, show notes up anymore. I closed those out on accident when I was looking up NYSEF. There we go. Uh, our last sponsor today is Rank With News. If there was a guaranteed way to get your business or your law firm ranking on page one of Google, featured in major publications nationally like Yahoo News, Forbes, Bloomberg, and others, and see those articles ranking sometimes in under eight hours for major competitive keywords that people were looking for, what else would you need to know? Rank with News is simply the most powerful way to hit page one in under two weeks safely, organically, and oftentimes permanently. It's functionally guaranteed SEO or search engine optimization on steroids, ranking quickly and sticking long term. If you're tired of poor visibility for your business, visit rankwith.news or rankwithnews.com to learn more and book a time to speak with a specialist about featuring your firm or your business in major national eight figure traffic sites that can launch you to page one in a matter of hours and help you dominate your local marketplace. Get media exposure, rank higher in Google, build credibility, and win more customers and clients with Rank With News. Alrighty, so we travel back in time, and we meet young Jonathan Leveritz, and he is fresh out of um, out of law school, got got just past the bar. What advice would you give yourself, and why? I would say study foreign languages, especially Russian, Italian, um, Hebrew, uh, Arabic. I would say any foreign language with a major foreign-based community that likes to go to people who speak their language, Korean, any time that I, I, I could have had or I did have free time and I did not take advantage of that uh, was a waste of time. Um, I, I have a, a large population of Russian-speaking clients that I wish I could speak to fluently. I know a few words, but nothing great. Um, I have Israeli clients. I, I have Arabic speaking clients. I have people who, who in general, um, you know, I've had over the years, 
you know, clients from numerous populations, all of whom, if I could have spoken to in their native tongue, I could have represented better and had a better rapport with. No, there's that old and joke. Unfortunately, I didn't. What, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. Trilingual. Somebody who speaks two languages. Bilingual. Or somebody who speaks one language. Well, American. Barely lingual. American. American. <laughs> I, was, I speak English and bad English. Those are my two that I'm fluent in. I actually took I took Japanese for three years in high school. I've taken Greek. I've taken Latin. I've taken French for reading. I can't pronounce it to save my life, but at one point I could pick through French. But yeah, I'm I'm, this, I'm in the same boat. I wish I had mastered uh, a language better. This brings me to a new sponsor, Duolingo. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll have to put them in here now. Shoot. Um, no, that's good advice. Uh, and, and nothing opens up the world for you like being able to speak other people's languages. It's actually this is a silly side story that I'll share really quickly. Um, my listeners know every so often I, I dabble in various forms of fiction. Um, I've tried writing them. Just I can always get to the beginning of the story and I can never quite get the end. But one of those questions that came up is if you could invent a superpower, what superpower would it be? And I was like, you know, if you could just speak and understand every language in the world, that would be one of the coolest superpowers to have because you would understand everybody. And that would mean everybody. so much. To you. you would be a connector, a unifier, you know, so many things. So uh, if you're out there and you guys are watching and uh, once you're done with this video, make sure you like subscribe and share, but then, Go learn another language. Go go push your brain a little bit more. And they they do say people that fluently speak more than one language, their brains are just wired differently. I mean, you really do have to kind of stretch your linguistic capabilities to to grasp the the nuances of another language. So I'm uh, I'm very respectful of anybody that can fluently speak even even two languages, uh, let alone three, four, or five, as some people can do. So that's good advice. Very good advice. Um, okay, so magic pen time. This pen is from uh, Saint Benedict's Abbey. It is a Catholic Benedictine Monastery in Atchison, Kansas. And uh, one of the one of the priests seems to have magically blessed this pen because I found that it can strike laws from the books, it can edit laws that are on the books, or it can add new laws from the books. So if I were to loan this pen to you, Yoni, and you could make one change to the law with this blessed pen, what change would you make and why? I would change the fact that uh, federal and state taxes are not a deduction for child support and not considered a deduction when you're dealing with maintenance, okay? Um, I think that uh, taxes are too high. I think people don't have enough money once they start paying support in many cases. I find lifestyles go down um, and they don't go up particularly for, for either side. They go down typically for both sides at the end of a divorce, um, whether it be payer spouse or, or non-payer spouse or, or or collecting spouse. And I think the issue really is um, you, you need to have a more level playing field. And I think also they should include tax impacting as a special law for people who are self-employed. That if you're making money off the books, your taxes have to be added to it and then deducted from it if we're going to have this equal system of everybody paying taxes on their uh, income. So... Either way, we look at this law; it has to be changed. Either no one should pay it, or everybody should pay it. The simpler, the simpler solution is just get rid of the taxes altogether, right? Oh yes, that that, that would be a wonderful thing to have happen. We could just get rid of the IRS and the tax code. We can we can use that for the magic pen. I am shipping you my pen right now. <laughs> Let's make this happen. <laughs> yes, please. That's awesome. Well, uh, Yoni, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me again today. Uh, again, I'm sorry for the the hiccup on the hullabaloo, but I'm glad we we're able to get you back on. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation today. As always, I do like to let my uh, guest have the final word. Is there any parting words of wisdom, any thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with before we uh, end the show today? Make the best out of everything with your children. Love them, hold them, hug them, be there for them. Try and understand them. I know teenagers are particularly difficult. I've gone through my share of them. And uh, just try and be there for them and take care of them. And no matter what happens, remember that as part of your divorce, children are always innocent. That is very good advice. Advice that I think all of us, at least if you have children, <laughs> all of us should be uh, benefiting from. I find myself Far too often looking at this stupid little box right here uh, when one of my kids comes up to me and, you know, dad, come play, come play Uno with me. I'm like, oh, I'll be right there. I got to get this email sent or whatever. I'm like, you know, 
that email will get sent whenever it gets sent. It's not the end of the world, but my five-year-old is only one to play Uno with me for so long. Um, so absolutely. Uh, I think that is some of the best advice we've ever had on this show. So thank you for that. That's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. And thank absolutely. you for having me. Absolutely good advice. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, as always, this has been the attorney post. Um, as always, uh, I've been chatting here with uh, Jonathan Lever Leverage. Who, uh, I cannot talk at the end of the show. <laughs> Jonathan Leverage, who runs the law firm that bears his name. That is leveragelaw.com, the Leverage Law Firm. As always, again, link in the description down below. As always, this podcast, though we do talk about legal issues a lot, does not constitute legal advice. And if you do have a legal issue, you should always seek the advice of a competent attorney in your area who focuses on the matter that you need help with. Obviously, having talked with uh, Jonathan a couple of times now, <laughs> I can say that if you're having some sort of a family law issue and you're in the New York area, uh, he would be a wonderful resource for you. So reach out to him, go visit leveragelaw.com or call 718-942-4002 and uh, set up a time to talk with them, you know, and, and at least figure out what your baseline rights are. Because as I always say, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. Until next time, again, as always, we appreciate a like, a subscribe, and a share on whatever platform you're on. And stay safe, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.